the wolf. She wants you to lie down with the wolf, the one who eats chalk to make his words as white as snow. So each letter lands in a puff of smoke. The one who likes red, who stays in bed so long he could become just another pattern in the wallpaper. She wants you to lie down with the wolf, the one she has clothed in wool from the mountain sheep, the one who is not as he appears, the one who treads time beneath his paws, which are always caked in flour, the one the children sing of. If you lie down with the wolf, the one who carries the wind in his belly, the one who can take a house from you, the one who hides in shadow, so the boy who cries wolf is a liar, she'll stroke your hair and smile secrets at you, slit him open and fill him with stones and watch you both sink. Um, I always read that one first because I don't have an introduction for it. I don't know what it means. <laughs> um, I'm going to carry on with um, a poem called Tuesday at Weatherspoons, which is about the Weatherspoons in Barrow and Furness, where I live. Um, I was telling one of the other award winners last night that this, this poem got rejected 15 times from 15 different magazines, and then it won this prize. Um, which I thought was quite funny, I was quite smug about that. But then um, the judge described it in his commentary as a convincing version of Dante's Lower Rings of Hell. It's just about the Weatherspoons in Barrow. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Barrow, it's not that bad. <laughs> Tuesday at Weatherspoons. All the men have comb-overs, bellies like cakes just baked, risen to roundness. The women tilt on their chairs, laughter faked, like mugs about to fall, cheekbones sharp as sadness. When the men stand together, head for the bar like cattle, I don't understand why a woman reaches across, unfolds his napkin, arranges his knife and fork to either side of his plate. They're all doing it, arranging, organising, all talk stopped until the men, oblivious, return. My feet slide towards a man with one hand between his thighs, patience in his eyes who says, you can learn to love me, ketchup on the hand that cups my chin, ketchup around his mouth, now hardening on my skin. Um, and this next one, I went, I went with my fiancé for a walk up Stickle Pike, which is in somewhere in Cumbria, and um, I'm not allowed to read this one if he's here. He's not, so I'm leaving it. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want you to. I don't want to put you off going to the Lake District because I've only ever seen this once. <laughs> <laughs> Picnic on Stickle Pike. You say you don't want me to describe the couple we saw halfway up Stickle Pike. The woman dipping her head to the man's white belly, his penis lolling like a Labrador's tongue. I try instead to write about our picnic the brown blanket you carried from the car, how you marched about, identifying flowers, spying with your binoculars on a fire engine crawling over Burka Fell. And what about the view, you say? We can see Scar Fell and Crinkle Crags and Harter Fell, and the sun is out and the wind farm is waving. But I'm thinking about that couple, middle-aged, embarrassed, hiding their faces in each other's tight embrace as we walked past. But before they noticed us, the woman was a long-necked bird, bending its proud neck to feed, and the man lay like an expensive table. This is another Cumbrian poem. Um, every year I play the trumpet in the Messiah, in a performance of the Messiah with West Cumberland Call Society. And this November, just gone, it was, um, a, I suppose, a tribute concert for the um, people that died in the shootings in Cumbria. And one of the, one of the people that died was a choir member, so, um, yeah, this is about that. The Messiah, St. Bee's Priory. Everywhere is covered in snow and the priory is a huge mouth swallowing the cold, as if the snow has come to dispel all memory, a day in June, the sudden heat of it, the constant call of sirens. 
I was standing on a hill in Barrow, looking over the water to Millum, knowing the police cars rushing past would be too late. The roads that brought the gunman there would stop them finding him. Askham, Broughton, Ravenglass, and all the tops of Corny Fell between, and people cutting hedges, riding bikes who hadn't heard the news, who would stop and help a passing driver without thinking. Today, November snow makes us more inclined to sit together. The violins gathered round a heater, the breath of singers caught in air. The audience, still in hats and coats and scarves, huddle closer, then lean forward as I call the dead to listen. They are singing hallelujah to forget that afternoon when the sun was a hand on the back of their necks, when villages hardly talked about before were the names on everybody's lips. The thing. It was a morning like this when you carried it in. There was no one to see but me. How it curled in your arms like something with feelings. How you moved like a ghost so it wasn't alarmed. That night its cry was disturbing. At first like a cat wanting food. Then like a dog that's been stepped on. And then realising itself abandoned. Its voice became suddenly human and lost. It drank the colour from our house, sucked the red right out of everything, the walls, the tablecloth, my jumpers. When it turned to us, left us the colour of pavement, we forgot how to see each other. I blamed you for opening the curtain so it could steal the blue from the sky. You went to get help, the thing at your heels, bright as a bouquet of flowers. How could you know that after you left, the colours came back, creeping? careful, wary. Each day I wait for your return, the sky grey, like something washed too many times. Will we leave it unspoken, that the thing, like all things, needs a name? Um, this next one's a new one. I always try and do one new one, at least. And it's, it's really scary doing a new poem, but um, in praise of arguing. And the, vacuum pe right. and the vacuum cleaner flew down the stairs like a song, and the hiking boots launched themselves along the landing. And one half of the house hated the other half, and the blinds wound themselves around each other. And the doors flung themselves into the street and flounced away, and the washing gathered in corners and sulked. And the bed collapsed and was held up by books, as the walls developed scars, and it was a glorious, glorious year. I have found one cheerful love poem in my set. I'll leave you. I'll leave you when grunters sleep in nests with legs unused to walking, when boars live among the leaves and rattle their tusks against the branches, when piglets fly and land in trees like birds and take flight at the sound of barking. I'll leave you then, when hogs mate for life like swans, when swine root for acorns in the tops of oaks, when the sow gives birth with the cries of herons in her ears, when the crow and the pig become friends, when the buzzard and the boar fly together, when they all dream their piggy dreams and the sly wolf goes hungry, not knowing to lift his head, when pigs fly, I'll leave. I've just realised as I was reading that it's not a love poem, it's a stalker poem, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a bit insane. Um, actually, I'm going to, my, I had to look what my collection that I put into the Eric Gregory was called as well, so I'm glad you said that, Tom. Um, mine was called If We Could Speak Like Wolves. Um, and it's, this, this poem, is, all the things in it are all the things that wolves do to each other to communicate. I read, I read some books about it, and there's a man called Sean Ellis who's called The Wolf Man, who lives with wolves. and. I've read some of his books. I think some of it is just making excuses for being a commitment phobic man. But some of it's good. And I'm always scared one of his exes, because he's got quite a lot of them, will be in the audience and I'll offend them. There aren't any Sean Ellis ex girlfriends here. If we could speak like wolves. If I could wait for weeks for the slightest change in you, 
Then each day hurt you in a dozen different ways. Bite heart-shaped chunks of flesh from your thighs to test if you flinch or if you could be trusted to endure. If I could rub my scent along your shins to make you mine. If a mistake could be followed by instant retribution and end with you rolling over to expose the stubble and grace of your throat. If it could be forgotten the moment the wind changed. If my eyes could sharpen to yellow. If we journeyed each night for miles, taking it in turns to lead. If we could know by smell what we are born to. If before we met, we sent our lonely howls across the estuary, where in the fading light, wader birds stiffen and take to the air, then we could agree a role for each of us, more complicated than alpha, more simple than marriage. And um, my last poem, this is for all the other Eric Gregory people. It's about a retired poet, because we've all got that to look forward to now. <laughs> oh, we're getting old now. Oh, where's Martin? <laughs> Three days and you turn 30 or something, isn't it? That's really old. <laughs> Retirement. <laughs> the poet has cut his hair and bought a flat in the city. At night he talks to the sky, but doesn't write it down. When he hears a pigeon call, he doesn't compare it to anything, even in his head. Each night from the window, all he sees are buildings. He ignores how the silver in the roof tiles looks like stars, how the shadow of a cat appears big as a tiger with the moon behind it. He's given his poems away, left them on bus seats, scattered the pages of his unfinished collection on the rails of the tube. Sometimes he imagines the footprints of the tube mice, sooty on his words, the swirl of pages showing off in the backdraft of the train. Thank you.